Good evening. Chuka Amuna was once tipped to be Labour leader, but today the Streatham MP quit the party he has represented in Parliament for nearly a decade. He was one of seven MPs to resign from Labour to form an independent group. Mike Gapes, the member for Ilford South, was another. But they were all protesting against Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, describing their former party as an embarrassment for its record on anti-Semitism, and Brexit. Well, Mr Corbyn said he was disappointed to see them leave. The mayor, Sadiq Khan, said the rest of Labour must now stick together. But could their stance change the face of politics in the capital? Here's our political correspondent, Simon Harris. I'm Shakura Mina. I'm the Member of Parliament for Streatham, the area... But not the I'm Labour from, Member of Parliament. Of Today, Mr Amuna was one of seven Labour MPs signed. to leave As their party and invite the voters the to back a new movement. If you want an alternative, please help us build it. The bottom line is this. Politics is broken. It doesn't have to be this way. Let's change it. Mr Munner was London's youngest MP when he was elected in 2010 and quickly tipped as a rising star. His mentor was the former culture secretary, the late Tessa Jowell. Lots of people are predicted to be big stars and they kind of, uh, they, they flash and then they burn out. And I don't think Chuck is going to do that. In 2015, he tried to become Labour leader, launching his campaign on Facebook. I will be standing for the leadership of the party. But within days he pulled out, blaming the pressure of being in the spotlight. His backing for a second EU referendum is one of the reasons his falling out with Labour has become terminal. Streatham has been a safe Labour seat for a quarter of a century. Mr Amunna's majority at the last election was more than 26,000. But he's not about to test the popularity of his new party with a by-election. Nor will any of the other seven, who include the Ilford South MP Mike Gapes, member of Labour for 50 years. Don't you owe it to your constituents to call a by-election? No. Members of Parliament are elected uh, not as delegates on a party list. We are elected as an individual to represent our constituency. And I've been elected seven times in my constituency of Ilford South. History tells us when the Labour Party splits, what it leads to is the Conservative Party winning general elections. So look, I'm distressed by any Labour member of parliament leaving our party. I think it's important we stick together. Who's to say that a new politics and a new grouping wouldn't attract a huge degree of support also amongst disgruntled Conservative voters? Let's not forget that they lost a number of seats at the last election. So nobody owns anybody's vote. Chuka Amuna has made no secret of his unhappiness at Labour's direction of travel under Jeremy Corbyn, whether it's Brexit, anti-Semitism or foreign policy. Today, an MP once seen as a future leader aimed a wrecking ball at his party. Simon Harris, ITV News, Westminster. Well, Simon is here. Simon, how much of an impact, if any, do you think this independent group will have on the political, um, the political landscape of London? These MPs have taken a huge gamble. If it is just the seven of them, it's hard to see what long-term impact they'll have after the initial hiatus. To become a new force in British politics, you need members, you need money. At the moment, they're not even a, a proper party. But what they really need to gain traction is for more MPs to defect to their movement. Now, Mike Gapes told me that he knows of other London MPs who are actively thinking of joining this new movement. And it is true that many, if not the majority, of Labour London MPs, quite a lot of them, are very angry that Jeremy Corbyn will not back a second EU referendum. But that's not the same as agreeing to defect. And if you speak to those regarded as the normal, usual suspects, they're publicly saying they're going to stay within Labour and fight from within for changes. All right, Simon, thank you. The seven MPs who quit Labour yesterday to form a new independent group today won the backing of a London politician who herself did the same nearly 40 years ago. Former Stevenage MP Shirley Williams was one of the infamous Gang of Four who formed the SDP in 1981. Now a Lib Dem peer, she described Jeremy Corbyn as a strange leader and told our political correspondent Simon Harris what went through her mind when she quit. Oh, I think great pain. Um, I'd, I'd been a member of the Labour Party since I was, I think, 15. And the idea of leaving a party which was not just you know, not just the party which I believed in, but also a party which was full of my friends, 
and a lot, most of my personal friends came out of the party uh, experience that we shared and had shared for a long, long time. Um, you know, we'd marched together, we'd been spat at together, we'd been shouted at together. We had become very, very close. So that made it a very painful step. What do you make of this new group? Do you like what you see? I like quite a lot of what I see. I think that they, among them are people I think of real talent and ability. Um, I very much like the fact that they spent a very long time, a very long time, two years or more, trying to persuade Jeremy, their leader, who was already clearly had great weaknesses as a leader. He seemed to fail to see that Brexit was going to be a key issue, like with us, militant tendency was a key issue. It's a strange leader, Jeremy. Decent man, but, but somehow really completely unwilling to seize opportunities. And I think that the group that we're talking about, the breakaway group, have shown an extraordinary level of patience and determination. Which of the seven would you like to see as the leader? No, I'm not going to enter that one. <laughs> there are very few people in that group who are making it, doing a sort of jump, uh, doing a Boris and making it clear that they think they should be the leader. They haven't done that at all. And some of them are natural leadership potential. What would your advice be to them? It would be to seize upon, there are some obvious issues, which in my view have been hardly discussed at all, even by the Labour Party, which are Labour issues. Take a couple of obvious ones, universal credit, where there has been, although it's very complicated, I accept that. And the second thing I think which is really important is that the on the whole question of workers' rights. Would you like to see this group joining forces with the Lib Dems, or would they be wise to keep their distance from existing parties? Nice question, and the answer is complicated, but I'll make it very simple. There are certain issues where there could be a natural meeting of minds, and I think that's fine. I think one of the things we need to do in Britain is to begin to build up again the concept that people can meet across party and work together in Parliament to achieve certain things that need to be achieved. Baroness Williams, thank you for talking to us. Thank you. Oh, Simon Shirley Williams describing Jeremy Corbyn as a strange leader. We did hear from him for the first time today on the split. What does he say? Yes, he didn't uh, respond yesterday to questions about the seven MPs who quit, but today he did and said he was disappointed and regretted their departure. John McDonnell went further and said Labour needs to have a mammoth listening exercise. There have been no further defections today, but Chukra Munna and Mike Gape surely aren't the only London MPs deeply unhappy at the way Labour is led. And they were two of the gang of seven. And Siobhan McDonough, for one, the MP for Mitchell and Mordham, is certainly giving the impression that she's thinking seriously about her future in Labour. All right, Simon, one to watch. Thank you. Good evening. As the debate continued into whether the UK government should help Shamima Begum return home from Syria, the 19-year-old discovered the Home Office had revoked her citizenship. The saga, of course, began when Shamima ran away to join IS when she was just 15, but now wants to come home with her baby, who's just three days old. But Home Secretary Sajid Javid believes that because her parents were born in Bangladesh, it means she has nationality there, but Bangladesh denies that. Our political correspondent Simon Harris is in Westminster for us tonight. Simon. Charlene, when is someone born and raised in Britain and given a British passport not a British citizen? The answer, it seems, is when their name is Shamima Begum and they've chosen to run away to live in a terrorist state. Today, the former East End schoolgirl's future was again raised in Parliament while she was told of her new status in Syria. Please find enclosed papers that relate to a, a decision taken by the Home Secretary to deprive your daughter Shamima Begum of her British citizenship. This was the moment Shamima Begum found out the British government doesn't want her back. In a refugee camp in northern Syria, she was holding her baby son when ITV News showed her a letter the Home Office sent to her parents. It's kind of heartbreaking to read. But I thought it would, my family made it sound like it would be a lot easier for me to come back to the UK when I was speaking to them in Barbos, but it's kind of, it's kind of hard to swallow. A former police officer who knows her family well thinks the decision to refuse her a passport is wrong. She's clearly uh, very, very confused. I think there's some mental health issues there. She's been uh, brainwashed. And we have to remember she was a 15-year-old child when she went out there and within a few days ended up marrying a man almost twice her age. There was also criticism of the Home Secretary in Parliament. In removing British citizenship, the Home Secretary is essentially saying 
She's somebody else's problem. Can he please tell the House what he expects to happen to Miss Begum's newborn baby boy? But the Home Secretary wasn't giving much away. I cannot talk about an individual case. Mr Javid said all cases were decided using a test of what is in the public good. I would uh, look at the evidence that's put in front of me. Some of it would be secret intelligence, some of it would be more publicly available information, and that will be used to determine uh, the, uh, the threat that, that individual may pose to the country. The Home Secretary's motives were questioned by London's Mayor. Do you accept that what the Home Secretary has done might be popular with some, many voters? You know, one of the things that uh, you've got to do when you're in a position of power and influence is not always chase the numbers. I appreciate uh, that the current Home Secretary wants to be the leader of his party. I appreciate he wants to be the Prime Minister. I appreciate uh, that this course of action may be very popular with uh, Conservative Party members. Nikita Malik has written reports on radicalisation for a think tank, the Henry Jackson Society. Who is going to be ensuring that her son isn't brought up as another soldier of the caliphate and isn't brought up to hate this country? Um, and, and, and she clearly hated this country when she left. But I do believe that the best place to uh, ensure that she doesn't pose a risk to us is here. Shamima Begum's family are expected to challenge the Home Secretary's decision in the courts. So it's likely to be a long time before she sees Bethnal Green again, if ever. So what are the immediate options open to Miss Begum and her son? Well, the Home Secretary seemed to suggest that whatever happens to her, it doesn't affect the rights of her son. So could he be offered British citizenship? And that begs another question. Would he be allowed to come to the UK without his mother? Miss Begum thinks she might be allowed to live in Holland. The jihadist she married as a 15-year-old in Syria is a Dutch citizen. She told ITV News that if he's allowed back to the Netherlands, she might be able to go there and wait for him while he's in prison. But tonight, Bangladesh was insistent that whatever the Home Secretary says, Miss Begum is not a Bangladeshi citizen. Simon, thanks very much. Now, there are just 35 days to go until we leave the European Union with the prospect of no deal looming. Two leaked reports today of how our travel could be affected. Well, one is about the impact on the Eurostar. The other is an internal email seen by ITV News from a Transport for London manager to staff highlighting concerns about public disorder and potential fuel shortages. Well, our political correspondent, Simon Harris, is at St Pancras Station for us tonight. Simon, what more can you tell us? Yes, as you say, Lucrezia, we got a glimpse today of one of Transport for London's contingency plans. Around 150 control room staff who oversee the buses and roads in London have been told they can't take leave during a three-week period around the Brexit date of March the 29th. An internal email, which ITV News has seen, spells it out. The reason for this decision is after reviewing the TfL Brexit risk reg register, it is likely the greater impact of a no-deal Brexit will be on surface transport due to risks associated with border disruptions and public disorder. Well, the City Hall, saw, City Hall source told me it's another very real reminder of what could happen with a no-deal Brexit. But the Mayor's Tory opponents are sceptical. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable that people can't take holidays, and that he's preparing, according to the TfL memo, for border disruption, what in London, and public disorder and fuel shortages in London, really. I'm told the main concern is that queues at petrol stations, long hold-ups at the airports and even riots in the streets could cause huge congestion and gridlock in London. And TfL isn't the only organisation doing behind-the-scenes planning. Another leaked document, this one from the Department for Transport, reportedly warns thousands of passengers having to queue for passport control here at St Pancras International. The Eurostar terminal is a crucial gateway to the continent and if, as suggested, 15,000 people a day will have to have their passports checked, that could mean people queuing for a mile along Euston Road. The DFT says it wouldn't confirm the existence of the document, but says it's developing sensible contingency plans to keep the Eurostar trains running. All right, Simon Harris. St Pancras, thank you.